I'm Timothy Snyder. I'm a historian. I wrote a little book called On Tyranny, as well as some other books. What I'm doing in this little series of videos, we're on number four, is looking back at the 20 lessons of On Tyranny, which I, I sketched out in 2016. It's now the summer of 2021. A good deal has happened in the meantime, much of it anticipated by the book. What I'm doing now is, is taking a very special occasion to return to these lessons, a special occasion being the fact that I've updated the text of the book, not the lessons themselves, but the text, in order to accompany a set of beautiful illustrations by Nora Krug. So the book on tyranny is appearing in a graphic edition in October of 2021. And between now and then, I'm going to release these 20 short videos about each of the lessons. I'm going to read a lesson and then make a few remarks about what we have gone through in the last few years and what we might expect in the years to come. So we're now in lesson number four. Lesson number four is take responsibility for the face of the world. The symbols of today enable the reality of tomorrow. Notice the swastikas and the other signs of hate. Do not look away and do not get used to them. Remove them yourself and set an example for others to do so. So this idea of reaching out with responsibility is, is central to the way that I think about freedom. If we think about freedom just in terms of what's easiest for us to do, what we find most convenient in a given moment, of course, we're never going to rub away a swastika. At best, we'll look at it with irritation and think maybe I'll do something about that later. But what if freedom is actually a collective project? What if in order for each of us to be free, all of us has to do, have to do something, if only a little something? And what if the signs that we see, the symbols that we see, little visual aspects of our reality, what if they are moments of choice for each of us and for all of us? Um, this is, by the way, a very important insight by someone who um, I knew very slightly and admired greatly, Václav Havel. Um, Václav Havel's most important essay, The Power of the Powerless, was written in communist Czechoslovakia, but its insights, I think, are universal. It was his point, and it was the point of many other dissidents, that one has to exercise a bit more responsibility than seems comfortable. And the way to, th the way to realize that a moment for exercising responsibility has come is these little irritants, right? These, these striking, these, these, these things which are slightly wrong about the outside world. So for example, a swastika. We take part in its existence by seeing it. Sure, you're not the one who painted the swastika, but in some sense you are partaking in its presence by walking by and doing nothing. This, is, this was Havel's point. Havel talked about the general panorama of everyday life and how in some sense we all co-produce it. And although each of us as individuals can only do a little to shape it, we're nevertheless making an important decision when we do decide to shape it. It was very cheering to me, very encouraging, that in fact, people did come out to whitewash swastikas. There were an awful lot more swastikas painted in public spaces in the United States of America in late 2016 and thereafter. And there were also groups who quietly, cooperatively, made sure that a lot of those swastikas were covered over immediately. Um, it wasn't surprising to me that more swastikas came up at that particular time. Um, I was glad to see that other people had, had, thought about th had thought about this lesson, which I'm sure they thought about in their own way, of taking responsibility for the face of the world. I wanna make a couple more remarks about symbols, because of course we're at a time where the symbols of the United States or the symbols of what the United States should be are hotly contested, which is completely normal, by the way. Monuments go up and monuments go down. Um, 
there is nothing more predictable, nothing truer about the history of public spaces than that. Monuments go up at a certain time, let's call it point A, in order to project into the future, all the moments after point A, a certain vision of the way the future should be. We think monuments are about the past. They're not about the past. Monuments arise in a moment of the past in order to influence the future from the point of view of point A, from the point of view of that past. And so when we think about monuments, we're not really talking about whether we're respecting history or not. History will be just fine with or without monuments. What we're thinking about is what version do we want to communicate into the future? And, and this is where I want to speak about something that I didn't speak about um, when On Tyranny was published, which is our own symbols. There were plenty of swastikas. There still are plenty of swastikas, but there are also American symbols that we have to, that we have to consider, or in some cases reconsider, like for example, the Confederate flag. Um, my sense would be that any symbol of the United States, which cannot be accepted by the broad population of the United States, and to put it very mildly, the Confederate flag does not meet that test, shouldn't be thought of as a national symbol. But to be a little bit more fundamental about this, symbols which represent um, a true part of our history, the history of, of, of bondage, of chattel slavery, symbols that represent a true part of our history can be understood as that. They, they, are, they are part of our history. The question is whether chattel slavery, bondage, racial inequality, whether those are the values we wish to project into the future. Displaying or drawing or carrying a Confederate flag means that. And it doesn't just mean that to black people. It means it in an objective sense because that's what the symbol meant at the time. So the Confederate flag isn't just one of a set of neutral symbols that can be assembled or, 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 or brought together um, in a random pattern. It has a, it has a specific meaning. If, you, if, if the wish is to project racial inequality and slavery as, as desirable values and practices, then that is what you communicate with, with that particular American symbol. And I, I focus on this because, of course, that symbol is very present in American political life. Um, as, as I'm sure all of you will know, the Confederate flag was paraded through the United States Capitol on the 6th of January, 2021, something which, to my knowledge, I mean, historians are taught never to say never because there's always an exception. But to my knowledge, that had never happened before um, in the prior existence of the United States. And so we have to ask ourselves, how could we be a country where that particular symbol could reach that particular place at that particular time? I don't think we have to ask ourselves whether that's a symbol we want to project into the future. I think the answer is clearly no. But on the other side, there's one more set of symbols that I want to talk about. As we've seen monuments come down, as we've seen graffiti sprayed on walls to, to represent um, various kinds of American values, one symbol which, which I see and which makes me deeply uncomfortable is the hammer and sickle. So for a number of young Americans, the hammer and sickle just means, I understand, I've heard it, I've heard it a hundred times or a thousand. It just means rejection of the status quo, something new. That may be what it means to you, but the hammer and sickle is, 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 is the central symbol of the Chinese Communist Party, which is uh, the most repressive major regime in the world right now. It's also the historical symbol of a number of communist parties which perpetrated policies of famine and terror. That might not mean anything to you, but it means a lot to an awful lot of people. And it also has a certain kind of objective meaning. It has a meaning in history, whether or not you're aware of it or not. Even if people weren't still alive who had suffered as a result of regimes that, that put forward that symbol, there would still be a meaning that you would be projecting into the future. So even as I don't have any problem with bringing down monuments, even as I don't have any problem with, with coming up with new symbols, I think we also have to make sure, you know, friends on the left, that we're aware of what symbols stand for before we propose them as substitutes. As for me, I want to say something new now about taking responsibility for the face of the world. Taking responsibility for the face of the world is not just about avoiding the bad things. It's also about creating the new things. The painting that we do shouldn't just be painting over. The painting that we do also has to be work of 
creation. One of the big problems that we have, a fundamental problem in the United States, is that we don't have a very good sense of the future. Um, and bringing down monuments, important though that might be, is not the same thing as filling up that space with a symbol for what we think the future should be, which of course is what monuments are all about and what art in some sense is about. And that's just the note that I wanted to, 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 to close on. Taking responsibility for the face of the world is not just about cleaning up. Taking responsibility for the face of the world also involves thinking about what the face of the world should be. And th this means confronting this problem that we have a very hard time thinking of the future. We have a very hard time thinking of the future. And without the future, democracy is very hard to maintain. And since we have this problem, we should recognize the people who can help. And the people who can help are the artists. The people who can help are the writers. The, writers. the people who can help are the poets. All the people who are shoved to one side by a society which is pragmatic or instrumental, um, which, which confuses efficiency with, with values or productivity with aesthetics. These are the people who are actually capable of helping us to think about what kind of face we would like the future to have or what kind of face we would like to be able to turn towards the future. So I wanted to close on that new note. Part of taking responsibility for the face of the world is thinking about what the future should look like and taking seriously the people who labor in the direction of, of generating possibilities, aesthetic possibilities and moral possibilities. Thank you.